This is Kathy Humbarger. It is my privilege to be sitting around the table with two pro-life heroes, and uh, we're just going to have a conversation about life issues and all the good things that are going on in the state of Indiana. My friends today are Pat Miller, the host of the very popular WoWo radio program known by his name, The Pat Miller Show. Thanks for being here, Pat. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. And my congressman, Marlon Stutzman, who I've known for several years. Congressman Stutzman, thank you so much for giving us some time today. We really appreciate it. We know you're busy traveling the state, and it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here with both you and Pat. We are facing a very interesting election cycle in this primary. I think all of us around this table would agree that regardless of of whether it's a local state or um, a national office, there is a lot of um, uh, swirling going on, and we feel like we're in the midst of the storm. Pat, I know that you talk to people every day. Have you ever seen an election cycle like this? Uh, Not quite to the extent of this one. Um, There are some things you expect every time. You expect um, a lot of indecision on the part of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You expect a lot of moving of positions by those running for office because some people try to step into certain limelights uh, at, you know, impromptu times Mm -hmm. so that they can stand out. Uh, Some people all at once will try to step a little more to the right so that they appear to be right. Um, And and I find that a little disconcerting sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you've talked about Marlon and and, um I've known Marlon now for probably almost a decade, and the thing that I have found about Marlon, and I know a few of the things that at least I would like to talk about as our conversation goes on today, is the conservatism that you find in the life and in the policies and the practices of Congressman Marlon Stutzman were not acquired when he ran for office, Mm -hmm. uh, nor did they come to him after he got to D.C. These are principles and precepts that he's had all along. Right. Um, I have found that uh, when other people running for different offices try to move to the right, they find Marlon Stutzman already standing there. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And Marlon, since this is an informal conversation, I'm going to uh, call you Marlon. That's right, um, that's fine. Rather than Congressman Stutzman, um, because we have been friends for a number of years. In addition to that, I'm probably old enough to be your grandmother. So uh, (laughs) all all that aside, um, I remember when you were... Um, a representative in the Indiana State House. You are the very first elected official that ever approached me to come to the State House and discuss life issues in uh, the public policy committee that mm-hmm. you chaired that year. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, we're going back a long time. Yeah, no, I, I do remember that. And, you know, um, to both Kathy and, and to Pat, you know, growing up um, and uh, as time would go by, you start getting involved in different uh, organizations and the life issue is always an important one in Mm -hmm. in our family and uh, to Christy and I, and knowing that uh, as we listen to Pat Miller on WoWo and uh, getting to know you through the Allen County right to life organization, um, you both were people that I looked up tremendously to because you were willing to step out and to talk about not only your uh, belief in the importance of protecting life, but your, your faith and who you were, uh, who you are as people. And that uh, that was an inspiration to, to myself. And so working alongside you both is is a real honor because I think that's what's going to make the biggest difference as we um, have uh, our different spheres of influence as we can, we can make things happen. And we're starting to see some of that progress here in our state. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and it's just a, a fact of political life that each elected official has a certain amount of political Uh, clout to spend, uh, for lack of a better word. And I've always been so appreciative of the fact, Marlon, that you were willing to spend your political clout, a good deal of it, uh, to protect unborn little boys and girls, and also Mm -hmm. to protect their mothers who are in a very difficult situation. Many candidates um, come to the table and say, I'm pro-life. They fill out a questionnaire. They press the button. And that's good. We, We appreciate that. But for someone to be a champion for life and use their political capital to advance the cause uh, is head and shoulders above what we usually see from candidates. And I'd just like to remind anybody who has an opportunity to listen to this conversation that you were pro-life before being pro-life was cool. (laughs) Um, uh, You consistently had a 100% pro-life voting record as scored by Indiana Right to Life when you were in the uh, uh, Indiana State House, and I know you've maintained that strong 100% pro-life voting record since you've been in Congress. 
You authored a bill which uh, required abortion facilities to meet health and safety standards and be inspected annually. And because of that, we have seen the closure of three abortion facilities in Indiana. Mm -hmm. That happened after you moved on uh, to Washington, but it was your investment that was the beginning of giving us the tool that we needed to get those abortion facilities closed down. You also co-authored a bill which provided that a person committing or attempting to commit a murder that caused the termination of a pregnancy, in other words, that little baby in utero uh, was killed, that they would be a sentence to additional time mm-hmm. uh, for the death of the baby. Um, you co-authored a bill that uh, would have prohibited state agencies from entering into con- to, uh, contracts or making grants to Planned Parenthood. That's been huge. That was before defunding Planned Parenthood was uh, uh, front and center on the pro-life stage. This was years ago. You were already leading the charge. You know, you know that, that speaks to that legacy we talked about. Exactly. This, this is not something that's new founded for you. This is something that's always been. And I, I was so impressed, Marlon, when we first met about your commitment to life and everything. And little did I know the full circle of the story, mm-hmm. because whereas you are a congressman who takes an incredible pro-life stance, there is a woman who ultimately became your mother mm-hmm. who took a right stance at a very difficult time that you're even here. Yeah. And that had to speak incredible to you as you were growing up. Well, it did. And, you know, and I didn't know the full story until uh, probably about four years ago uh, when we were uh, on the floor of the House discussing the uh, Gosnell court case from Philadelphia, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. the abortion doctor. And, uh, and that was when my mom and I actually had that conversation. But I always knew there was more... There was, um, you know, I knew that I came early and uh, <laughs> that my mom was very young when uh, she had me. But uh, my mom and my dad always talked about the importance of life and that it's a gift from God. And my parents were in foster care. They took care of little babies that came straight from the hospital that were kind of in, in limbo, whether they were going to go to adoptive parents or go, you know, with their Um, uh, paternal parents. And so we were always around children. Mm -hmm. And my mom comes from a family of 11. Uh, Family was such an important piece to our, uh, to my childhood growing up. And so it was always just assumed that we we were going to always stand for life. And then when my mom told me the story about how she uh, became pregnant with me when she was 17 years old and tried to find an abortion clinic, um, in a very difficult time in her life, mm. it just gave me a whole new perspective. This became very real to you. Yeah. Very real. Uh, because, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here today if she had found her way to the abortion clinic. And so that uh, gives me even more boldness and a, and a platform to talk about the fact that in 1976, the federal government would not have stopped my mom from having an abortion mm-hmm. because of Roe versus Wade. And so I feel very free and uh, very, uh, bold about, mm-hmm. emboldened about the ability to speak about this issue. I mean, right. when, when somebody comes up to you counter to your position, I mean, there's something inside of you that says, don't yeah. bring Wait that to me, I've not been there. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I, and, 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 then, and then when you and Christy had your first son, mm-hmm. you have your son, yeah. 9-11 happens, and you're sitting there watching all this while you're cradling him in your arms, and it's then that you said, I need to do something. That was that was the mindset that yeah. led you to the state house and all these things that Kathy has mentioned that you did. But then you go to Washington. How much stronger does this call for life have to be in you to stand up against Washington? I've heard politicians say you almost can't get elected in Indiana if you're not pro-life, which Mm -hmm. is not necessarily true. But being pro-life in Indiana is one thing. How much more difficult is it to be ramrod straight about life standing on the floor in D.C.? Yeah, you know, it's uh, people would not say this. Uh, out loud as publicly as what the reality is, but but uh, the the two parties, you know, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, are ma- the mostly divided over the abortion issue. There are maybe two or three Democrat pro life members of Congress, and there are just a handful of Republicans who are pro abortion. So, so, so if you were going right to the core, more than immigration, more than taxation, more than anything else, abortion is the divider. Planned Parenthood and the pro-abortion movement is so powerful. Their lobby is so powerful in Washington. The sides are drawn. And, you know, just like, uh, you know, any Democrat who's pro-life, they're constantly looking over their shoulder in a primary by because of a George Soros or Planned Parenthood mm-hmm. organizations like that that want to beat them because they don't toe the line 
on the abortion issue. I, I've, I've never doubted you on the floor of the House, and I think it's always been important that you've been that kind of a voice. Should you have the ability to take this voice to the Senate, mm-hmm. how much more does your voice get amplified? How, how large does it get that you're not one of 435, now you're just one of 100? Oh, it's much, much bigger. And the Senate is always the, it's the final hurdle, the highest hurdle to get bills passed before they get to the president. And so having a pro-life Senate and, and senators who are willing to stand up, and I think with the, the story that I have, and I know that there's others that uh, have a similar story, as younger, you know, as younger people who are born after Roe versus Wade and have a, a similar story are elected to Congress, I think that's more powerful mm-hmm. that we can actually start turning the tide in, in wow. Washington. Exactly. Yeah. And you've shown over and over again, Marlon, that you are willing to stand up to um, your own party if mm-hmm. necessary. Mm-hmm. I know that the life issue has been used by a bargain uh, as a bargaining chip in some situations, yeah. uh, particularly in the Senate. And I am so excited to think that you will be there being that strong voice. Pat, I know you talk to a lot of elected officials and a lot of candidates. Um, have you seen situations where they say they're in support of life or an, uh, any other issue that might be important to us? And then when they get there, it's, well, uh, I didn't know that it was going to be about immigration, too, or I didn't know it was going to be right, about taxes, right. or I didn't know it was going to be about whatever. Yeah, I've heard a lot, especially within the last year, uh, in other congressional districts, mm-hmm. not the third, where people have said, you know, when it came time to politicking, my candidate said this, this, and this. We trusted him. We pulled the lever. We put him in there. And somehow when they got to office, things veered a little off mm-hmm. course. And then when re-election comes, they try to veer back and get back in place. Right. Th- this is why, for me, and I'm not talking as a talk show host now. I'm talking as a husband and a father who lives in the third district. This is why I sleep a little bit better at night, not having to worry about the position that my congressman holds, right. because I know that when I wake up in the morning, the position that he had yesterday will be the position he had today. Exactly. It, it's not wavering. And on the life issue, which both of you know, um, that I'm a single issue person, if a candidate stands strong for life, both in the campaign and then after they're elected, that is a window into the, the soul and character of that individual. And Marlon, I've got to tell you that all those years ago when you called me up and I was so tongue tied that I called you Congressman Stutzman, I think in that phone call, if I'd have have, uh, thought about it, I'd have called you Senator uh, Stutzman. But um, in all those years, I have never seen you give an inch. And more importantly, I've seen you take the lead. You're the one that has authored these bills that have sponsored them, co-sponsored, co-authored, chaired committees that pushed legislation through. And, you know, that's not always an easy thing to do. And as important as all of this, caucus meetings happen behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And nothing is supposed to be said about what is discussed in those caucus meetings. Yet I know with 100 percent certainty that I can count on you to be a voice for the unborn little boys and girls and their their desperate moms the same behind closed doors as you are in the spotlight. So I want to take this opportunity again to thank you for being the exceptional candidate, the exceptional elected official uh, representing the state of Indiana. And I look forward to the day when you're sworn in as the senator, the U.S. senator from the state of Indiana, because the babies and their moms Mm. are going to be the beneficiaries of that. You're head and shoulders above anyone else. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And again, you know, it, it's an, it's easier when we have the ability to stand shoulder to shoulder with one another and with uh, with you and Pat. Uh, it, it's about uh, just stepping up and speaking out. And this is one of the things that I see in Washington too often. A lot of people feel a particular way, but they're afraid to actually say it and mm-hmm. say, you know what, I am pro-life. And if, if they see that somebody's willing to say, let's take on the challenge or let's take right. on that fight, you find people that are willing to stand up and fight with you. And so when we speak out, uh, when Pat goes on his, his program and talks about the importance of life and the gift of life, then people are going to hear that around the state and say, you know what? I, there's somebody else out there that feels the same way I do. So standing together is what makes us successful. Well, here. Babies are being saved because of the hard work you did when you were in the state house and the work that you've continued in Washington, D.C. And we look forward to having many more conversations with you as Senator 
Marlon Stutzman. Mm -hmm. All the best, and we'll uh, certainly stay in touch.